Good evening, students. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Right. So, yesterday we started with unit 10, right? So, human growth and development. We started discussing different stages of human growth. And before that, we went on discussing, discussing about the growth versus development, how growth is different from development. Correct. And then we started discussing about various stages as uh, specified in the syllabus. Like we finished talking about the, I think, brief idea of different stages and the periods of them. And then we also talked about prenatal stages before birth, right? I also sent, showed, uh, I think I sent a link for a video, uh, which might have given a bit of idea about how we go through different phases, like uh, different trimesters. And there we talked about the first, second, third trimesters and first trimester ways where you notice the formation of uh, embryo and the germinal layers. And from germinal layers, different parts of the body are organs starting to form. Correct. So majority of the formations happen in the first trimester and into the second trimester. And they slowly undergo maturation. So you start noticing this, they, they, they develop right further. So baby by the end of the second trimester have working parts and they further mature in the third trimester. So that's how I think the babies take shape into the, into the shape of the humans indeed. But before that, they look more like the other mammals inside our body. So this is how, and you notice that in general, we have a very long gestation period. We have long gestation period. Okay, and in addition to the long gestation period, when children are born, you notice that human kids are actually immature in the sense they are not ready to survive right out. Correct? Imagine how the calves are. Cattle can have a child which is ready to walk in few hours. Correct? You might have noticed this. A, you know, small calf when it is born, they even say that you know cattle kicks it. Okay, and what happens? They can start moving. They can start walking. They have well developed their mature, you know, uh, progeny that is formed. But humans, it is a different story. For us, what happens? We actually notice that we have, you know, about nine months of a gestation period, and we tend tend to have only one child usually. Rarely dupl du duplex or sorry, rarely duplicates or twins are possible. And uh, rare of rarest of the rare, you may find the triplets and quadruplets. So, because that is physiologically how our body is designed. Okay. So, like that, we notice enough differences uh, of humans along uh, in comparison with the other uh, animals out there. So, one, we see long gestation period and we see that immature babies who are born who are not ready and require enough child care. Some of these aspects we'll, we'll talk in the uh, theories related to fertility. There are a few theories where we discuss about uh, what type of family structure we notice and what type of reproductive activity we notice in the families. Especially uh, to support this period, this phase where, you know, the infants are not ready, they are not independent, we need to provide enough help to them. So biologically, these are all designed. Okay. So keep, keep in your mind of what changes or what differences we have. Some of the theories will make sense to you later. Okay, mostly in the 11 that we are going to discuss few of these theories. And uh, also, I think uh, we're going to talk about in the 10 itself, theories and observations related to aging. So few of these concepts that we are going to discuss would give you some insight into it. Right, let's continue with the, the various stages. This is where we kind of stopped yesterday. So different stages, right? And um, eventually, once the baby finishes that uh, the gestational period, 
after about nine months normally they say 10 days over nine months so during that period uh, i think baby gets ready to leave the mother's womb okay and this process is called parturition process of birth is called as parturition process of birth so briefly what happens here excuse me briefly what happens here so as i was telling you i think you might have seen in the video as well the baby if uh, the, in the fetal stages is kept in the on the bag with enough cushioning with enough food correct remember how is that bag called what is that fluid called where baby is kind of uh, immersed amniotic fluid amniotic. amniotic fluid right so you might have seen remember we discussed about the biochemical testing and genetic screening that is done the dna testing that is done on the baby's amniotic fluid in the video if you have noticed it they have nicely shown so amniotic fluid contains fetal cells and those fetal cells are normally taken out correct so amniotic fluid provides that cushioning and also the environment that is required for the development so amniotic fluid and the layer around it is chorionic layer multiple layers are there but usually remember these two chorion is the outer covering and then there is a bag like structure in which amniotic fluid is present within which the baby is but over a period of time what happens the amniotic fluid decreases and baby starting to take the, take the space most of the space the baby is usually moving around as we were talking about during certain stages eventually when it is time for the baby to come out baby positions like this down towards the entry point through which it has to come so this is the cervix part of the uterus so if you notice this part this is cervix part and babies are normally positioned towards that so normally head comes out imagine if feet is coming out it's very difficult to pull the baby out because they may get stuck that is why usually head positions down so this is indicating that it is a time for the delivery okay so then the cervix slowly dilates so and what happens it opens up slowly and baby starting to push itself for that push muscle contractions are required in news i think in last couple of years we have been hearing about this hormone which is responsible for controlling the muscles what is that hormone any of you a hormone which controls the relaxations and contraction contractions of the muscle especially important during the parturition process what is that hormone produced by brain it became controversial because indian government wanted to ban that hormone not complete ban but ban in production of that hormone by private organizations no idea oxytocin hormone oxytocin oxytocin hormone plays an important role here it controls the movements of muscles in the uterus thereby allowing the birth process delivery process so this is what happens uterine contractions increase in strength and infant is delivered so is all hormonally controlled okay and then what happens the connection between the mother and the baby what is the connection the placenta is the mother side part and the umbilical cord so you see the connection of placenta to the umbilical cord this comes off that's how baby is normally uh, delivered and in this process you notice that so with respect to this process i would like to show you this difference that we have between you know so other primates and uh, other animals in us okay is that just have it here yeah this image if you notice in uh, chimpanzees we are looking into the chimpanzees on the top here and the bottom is for the humans how the pelvic region is designed differently for apes and us we'll we'll study more about it in the primate behavior and uh, evolutionary factors that uh, design us okay you notice that for chimpanzees they actually have more broader exit point okay the pelvic region has more broader structure and also bones are organized in such a way that a bigger version of the baby can be delivered so majority of these things majority of the animals this is true so they can fit the baby and not much of stress as you notice here the babies can easily be delivered but look at humans if you see the human that pelvic region the cervix region that we are talking about 
the bones are designed in such a way that baby's head has a limitation. It can only have so much of size. So for a natural birth process, it is actually a very tight situation for the baby. And baby has to twist. As you notice here, in chimpanzee's case, the babies of chimpanzees can come out like that. But in case of humans, they actually have to rotate a bit. 180 degree rotation, you notice it. So head fits like this, okay, in terms of width. And then it has to rotate, like body has to rotate like this in order to allow the baby's movement through this channel. Okay, and you also notice, we'll talk about this in the forensic anthropology, forensic uh, anthropology, especially for gender differences that we have. So you notice that in, in females, this bone, this particular bone is actually away. Whereas in men, this bone actually comes close to it. I will show you these, these things and I'll explain you with a video. So there you notice that uh, the way our pelvic region is designed is different from the primates. So in primate comparison, this is a point, something that we need to know. And also here in evolutionary context, any idea why are we designed like this? Why are we designed where we actually go through or take enough risk? Because it's very difficult. There's enough of uh, deaths happen during this process of delivery, especially in the olden days, when there is not much of intervention. If something had happened, if the baby actually turned the other way around. So the delivery, the survival rate of the babies were actually less compared to what we are seeing today. So in evolutionary point of view, what is the significance of this? Why are we actually having that, that much of crowdedness and less flexibility to allow the babies you know, being delivered? Any idea? What is the limitation here? Why is our structure, pelvic structure designed like this? What is the link? Why can't we have a bigger, you know, uh, structures? Pelvic girdle, it is normally called. Why can't we have bones that are designed like that in a way that we have a better, better uh, freedom, more freedom for the baby to come out, causing less but risk? Maybe is it, it due uh, to bipedalism. Bipedalism, yes, we shall. Yeah, I also think maybe it, it interferes with our ability to walk. Exactly. So the way. The pelvic region is designed mainly to allow the mainly to allow us to walk on two feet as as opposed to the other primates you know, which actually can walk on the four four limbs okay so it is designed we have certain restriction and limitation here that kind of puts us at risk during the delivery process but as part of evolution we are designed like that i think we'll notice that i think parts of the body uh, they undergo we have bones which provide us more flexibility they're, they're less joined in the initial phases Okay, that is because to provide the flexibility during the delivery process. But definitely it's kind of a balance between allowing us to walk on two feet and having a big, big pelvic girdles, you know, which allow us, which allows the baby to come through easily. So this is kind of a trade-off. Okay, we'll discuss more on this, but I want to just put an a put little bit of idea onto this so we can see the connection between the growth aspects as well as the, the design aspects in evolutionary concept. So do kangaroos also have uh, pelvic griddle like us? Because uh, they are also on two feet. Exactly, but definitely they are, they are very different the way they are designed because there's type of animals which carry babies in a type of a bag, right? So, and the way they stand, if you notice it, the, the way the design is, is very, very different. I don't think so. I don't think we have the same design, but definitely they have a bit of unique structure in that. I have not uh, noticed that thoroughly. Okay. But definitely, I, I don't think they have the same problem like we have. Let me let me check that, if there's any comparison or similarity between them. But I doubt that. Sir, yes. Sir, for uh, all other mammals, do the head portion automatically positions to come out first? Or it's just for humans and say maybe uh, apes? For them, it may not be matter too much. I don't know uh, the answer to that. Well, I think so. I believe so. I think it's easy if they come head down. But I have to check. I have to cross check. I've never compared that. Uh, but they have more flexibility for sure compared to us. So it might not matter too much for them. Okay, but I, let, let me check. Let me uh, you know, kind of read a bit on that. But I, believe... I do remember seeing a few goats or maybe uh, cattle 
they have their feet and also the head coming out for us. No, I, I have to check that. I don't, I don't remember that, but yes, you can definitely compare the difference with respect to that. So, just wanted to briefly mention about this. And now let's move on to the other stages of human growth. So, now from the prenatal, we'll move on to the postnatal part. And one thing I want you to just keep an eye on or realize that the shape of the body changes quite a bit. So, prenatal, you notice that heads are too long. We actually have longer heads, and the size of the head changes over a period of time. And the trunk size increases as we age. So initially what happens, we have longer heads in the prenatal time, in the fetal stages, and the relative to the body, I think we see bigger heads, but eventually what happened, the head size, head size decreases, in the sense, head size in proportion to the body size decrease, so relative size would decrease, because the trunk will grow as we age. Thereby, in the end, we notice that we have a smaller, relatively smaller heads and a big trunk, and it is opposite in case of the fetal stages. Fetal stages, we actually have bigger heads and smaller trunks and opposite goes to in the later stages of our life. Okay, right. So as we proceed, I also want you to make a note of things such as the rates, the rates of growth, okay? So as soon as the baby is born, newborn we call, right? And uh, infant. So usually from two zero to three years period, for example, so you see rapid growth. Babies grow really fast. So you see kind of variation in their growth as they grow. But then in childhood, as a toddler, you start seeing them that growth kind of decreases. The sharp growth is not noticeable during the childhood slight decrease in the growth rate. But again, in the adolescent stages, rapid growth, or we call it growth spurt, growth spurt happen. I'll explain that briefly in comparison between girls and boys, how that actually varies. But normally you see rapid growth in, uh, in infancy, and then you see slightly slower growth in childhood, and then further on, rapid growth is seen. Then eventually what happens, the growth kind of ceases. Cells multiply, replacing the dead cells. Or dead skin goes off, new skin comes. Dead hair goes off, new hair comes. But you know, otherwise growth is more or less minimal. After adulthood, we see minimal growth. Even it may lead to negative growth in later stages of life. When we become old, you may even notice that we tend to actually lose our height for multiple different reasons. I'm going to talk to you that in forensic anthropology part, we may even lose the height. We may even become short for different reasons. Okay. So overall, this is what you notice. We have periods of rapid growth and slow growth. And then we kind of move to the minimal growth phases when we reach adulthood. And then even maybe negative growth is seen when we age. Okay. In elderly ages. Okay. This is a generic pattern of growth. How growth actually changes over a period of time. Along with this, we also notice different dimensions to development aspects. Growth, as we discussed in last class, that uh, growth in size, quantitative growth that we discussed about, a measurable growth we discussed about, which is what we were kind of aiming in this image. 
but also different aspects of development also we notice. Correct. Let me briefly tell you what are those developmental aspects and then I'll put that into the context of a given stage. Like we'll talk about the childhood and adulthood, etc. So let me first show you examples of development which happens actually in these phases because we finish talking about prenatal stages in infancy and childhood. You start noticing, especially in the infancy, you start noticing different changes. What type of developmental aspects along with the growth do you notice? So you see few reflexes. You notice few reflexes in the children. Right? So you actually try to touch the baby's mouth or baby's cheek, not, not normally mouth, but the baby's cheek. What happens? Baby starting to open the mouth. So these are all different reflexes that you notice. Sudden, you know, responses by the baby that you notice. This is called rooting. So if you stroke the infant's cheek, baby tends to open the mouth, okay? Responding to the touch, basically. And if you give your finger to the baby or something that is a bit more solid, baby starting to grip it, hold on to it. So the concept of gripping is normally seen. And a toe curling, you touch the you know, baby's uh, toes or the sole part. So what happens? Babies tend to actually curl their feet. So like that, you see some reflexes. So majority of these things that you notice that are inherently seen in them, they're responding to the environment. These are all possible because of the like muscular movements and skeletal system ability that they have, they're able to perform these reflexes. You might have seen Babel startle. So if sudden sound happens, if they're in the sleep, or they probably had a bad dream, sometimes they say at home, they startle. They actually make sudden movements in the body. They throw their hands and legs like this and as if they're stretching. Suddenly they do that. So like that majority of these reflexes can be felt in the infant stages. So there's a rapid growth that happens. They grow in length. Their head size also changes. Okay. And also you notice certain reflexes in them. So, but still they are very dependent on the parents and the mother especially at this stage so they're not ready this postnatal postnatal yes so in infant stages so postnatal the first one is an infant so we're talking about different features of infant so what do you notice in the stages of infancy so first one year we're talking about here is where you start noticing the growth Initially, they, they lose a little bit of weight. And remember, we were talking about a bit of chubbiness that they have. The fat, especially called brown fat, that protects them from the variation in the temperature of inside the mother's womb and outside the mother's womb. So, certain changes in the fat changes happen. Movements happen. And there are some reflexes that we notice. The babies tend to grow faster. And put, they put on weight also pretty well in the first year. So usually babies are born about uh, 3 to 4 kgs. Birth weight is about 3 to 4 kgs. Minimal they say 1.5 kg, but 3 to 4 kgs. Eventually they put on weight up to 7-8 kgs. They double within first year. About 8-9 kgs that they, 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 weigh, they weigh normally in the first year. That is what you notice in the infancy. And majority of the things are they're not very independent as I was telling you. They have to rely on nutrition from the mother. So, and also, uh, they, they slowly start recognizing people, but otherwise they don't see much. Their vision is not well developed, they say. They, they see, you know, they, they, they cannot recognize faces in the first three, four months. We, we usually assume that they can recognize us, but first few months they can know the parents. They know someone who's close to them, but they don't know the specifics. Only after a few months, they're starting to notice that, find the colorful world. Otherwise, I even heard that they don't even see the colors in the initial months. So slowly they start picking up this information. Okay, movements. And then eventually what do you see? Do you notice them? They make certain uh, developmental activities show or are, are visible. So motor skills, gross motor skills develop in these stages. From infancy and now I'm talking about the, about the three year period. The three year period that we talked about. Okay. So the three-year period, what do you notice here? You notice various changes. Motor skills are visible. Motor development that you notice here. Initially, the newborn, you know, tend to actually sleep like this. 
and turn around. And eventually, what do you notice? They can hold the chin up. They can able to lift, utilize the neck. Neck muscles starting to strengthen. They will have the strength in the neck muscles. They can hold up the chin. First two to three months normally, they say that they are developing. and slowly they can show the ability to lift the chin eventually what happens they can lift their chest second month on so you can see that they lift the chest so after a few months around fourth fifth month child slowly with your support can sit till then you hold the baby you know uh, on your shoulder okay or you know arms because baby doesn't have much much uh, strength to hold up but slowly these features develop and eventually you can hold the baby baby can sit with your help and around 6 months time 6 to 7 months time baby can sit by themselves so spinal cord you know basically the uh, backbone strengthens uh, strengthens here muscular strengthening happens here they are able to sit like that so slow growth that you notice in this in this stage able to lift the neck and hold the neck up hold the chest up sit with help sit alone and then eventually they can stand up with the help of someone so this happens towards the first year of them so 9 to 12 months you normally notice that they are able to slowly stand up this may vary sometimes babies may not walk for one and a half year i think there is a variation in the growth and normally they say girls actually have a faster growth at this stage in terms of these movements okay so calling is common about 9 to 10th month period okay slowly they are able to stand up and make some baby steps so this is what we normally notice in the first one year period so what are you noticing here their motor skills are developing so this is part of the development or growth mainly it is part of the development is an example of the development But growth has to eventually happen. Growth has to happen in order to support this process. But it is maturity. We are seeing the maturity in the process as motor skills, learning how to control the head, crawling, sitting. So their fine motor skills are also developing. They can grip the things. They can hold the things. Initially, they say that I think there are some theories on this or general ideas on this, on the features of the growth. They say that generalized features develop first, and specialized features develop next. as we are talking about this right from head to toes the development happens from the center to the farther parts similarly generalized to specialized features okay they can hold on to something like this. slowly they can use the thumb to the grip so specifics would develop okay so key aspect that we notice in this stage is the development in the gross motor skills So in infant, you notice these type of skills. Okay, part of it. I think initial phase we can also call this as a newborn baby, or which overlaps with the infancy as well. So these are the key changes that you notice. So these are the features of the this stage. Food wise, as I was telling you, mostly depends on the mother's milk for about six months, and normally after the sixth month period, they supplement with uh, you know specific type of food. I think we were talking about this in the nutritional deficiency diseases right mostly cereals soft cereals for example are rice okay this type of material is given to them so slowly their uh, ability to grasp things or ability to chew things begins but they, do they have teeth in the first year is the teeth developed in the first year when do they get teeth so usually towards the end of this first year 9 10 months period is when the development of teeth also begin so they are able to before that they are able to just gulp it okay and now at the 9th to 12th month of course they will not get enough teeth but few teeth that you notice like bunny teeth for example the initial teeth that forms i will show you what teeth come first the pattern of teeth is important for both the unit 12 and this because depending on the pattern of teeth formation you can recognize the age so in the in the early ages i think uh, it's easier to recognize the age by looking into the dentition process teeth formation process okay right so this is something that we see and then uh, eventually we notice that 
So did I say the first few months, right? I think I was totally wrong. <laughs> it was aiming at years, not months. So they don't develop the teeth in the first year. So I'm referring in the first 10 years period where they start developing from these teeth. Well, you'll see that. In few months, I'm going to show you the list, the pattern of this development. I'll probably show you that here. So the first year, we start seeing the eight to 12 months period, we start seeing few of the teeth that develop. Okay, so this is the period. So the eruption of the teeth plays an important role here. So the milk teeth develop at this stage and permanent teeth is obtained in the first decade. So usually after about five years of period. So the first year, the beginning of the baby teeth are milk teeth begin, or primary teeth it is called. So you probably know the uh, names of them, names of the teeth. How many teeth they have? The child of one year old and two years old. In the infancy, how many teeth they normally have? Before five years of age. What is the maximum number of teeth they can have? Milk teeth. Two. Milk two. teeth. 20. So you see the image, these are all milk teeth, primary teeth. Three, so you see four here and uh, three, three. Okay, 10. 10 in the upper teeth, upper side and 10 the bottom side. So totally 20 milk teeth they will have, which will go from anywhere from the sixth, seventh month or eighth month to the few years, about three years, it will go on. So from the seventh, eighth month to the three years time, you notice the formation of this 20 milk teeth. So first year they may have only three or four, right? So you notice the central scissors mainly in the first phase. So these central scissors, these are called central scissors. You know, this teeth that picks, takes out is the canines. You see the dog has a bigger teeth like this. These are, they are canines, right? So canines are these. Between two canines, you have four teeth in the upper side and four teeth in the downside. So totally eight of them. And eight to 12 months, normally they form these central scissors. The central scissors normally form, especially the the bottom one forms the first. Six to 10th month period, the part bottom ones form the first and then the upper ones. So what comes first, what teeth come first in them? Incisors, these incisors, which help in cutting the food. Incisors. The central incisors, lateral incisors. Lower incisors, upper incisors. So low, usually lower incisors come first and then upper incisors. Slight variation in the order may be seen, but usually you notice that the bunny teeth we normally this in central incisors come up first. Central, bottom, central, top, and then lateral side ones. So by the end of the first year, usually they may contain this these teeth. So there's four bottom ones, four the top ones. So about eight of them. Slight variation may be there, but about a year you may find these teeth form initially. Then after that, following that, you notice the canines, the sharp teeth. To sharp teeth, mainly, basically to you know, pull off or cut the food in such a way that you can actually break it. For meat eaters, they have bigger canine teeth. Apes also, you notice bigger teeth because they're not only useful in chewing, they can also be useful in fighting. Correct? We as humans don't need it. So we don't have bigger canines, but canines, of course, still stands out from the incisors. So they form about 16 month period to the 22 months period. The top ones come first and the bottom ones should be later, 17 to 23 months. So in a 24 year period, you will see these four teeth formed, two canines top, two canines to the bottom. So about 12 teeth should come up here by the second year. So you see that a specific pattern of teeth formation with little bit of variation here and there, which can be used in identifying their age. So following this front teeth, we get the molars. Molars are the back teeth. First molar, second molars. So usually they have two molars in the children. First molar and second molar. Okay, first and second molars. So by the end of uh, about 25 to 33 months, in the third year where they develop this. So to, together in the third year, they should get about 20 months, 20 teeth, milk teeth formed in their mouth. So this is also a, a distinct change that we notice in the children. A clear change that we notice in the children. Clear change that we notice in the 
children and one thing i want you to notice is same thing goes same order is followed when the teeth the milk teeth sheds off and a permanent teeth forms when does permanent teeth begin at the around the age of 6 to 7 years period at the around 6 to 7 years period so in the adulthood and the childhood not adulthood sorry childhood stages you notice that so mostly in the middle childhood they say 6 to year 6 and above they tend to call middle childhood so during this stages what happens the permanent teeth begin permanent teeth begin in the same order the way they came they actually shed off in the same manner so what goes first central incisors of the bottom and the central incisors of the top and replaced by the permanent teeth okay and they continue for about 10 to 12 years so from the infancy they go to the childhood stages right so these are the major features that you notice in the first i think our my focus was on the infancy but slowly we also talked about the aspects of childhood but i'll give you a few more concepts on child otherwise these are some features that you can remember with respect to the childhood okay so few other aspects of development few examples of development that happened in these stages and also partly in the childhood stages so childhood so either if you consider up to 3 years is an infancy and after that is early childhood 4 to 6 years okay and then 6 to 10 years is middle so childhood goes from up to about 10 years or so right up to puberty before we go to adolescence so in these stages what do you notice lot of developments happen what how how are they ordered look at different developments or maturation aspects that we we see so vision as i was telling you in a few months first few months it develops by the age 1 by about 7 8 months they develop vision they able to recognize things so eyes are already there but they undergo maturation they develop further the functionality component will develop during this first year period for vision speech when do they talk when do they start making noises and when do they actually starting to talk what age do you hear children talking so children make some sounds right in the first phase in the one year first one year beginning few months four months three four months they starting to make sounds the oo sounds that they normally make and eventually when you see that after six seven months close to one year they starting to say few words so, but it takes about a year to two to one half years so this is when after a year you start seeing their ability about one and half year sometimes up to two years sometimes depending on very variation again between children can be seen here but they starting to say something say words amma nanna arma whatever whatever words so the regular words are normally able to say so speech developments happen within this infancy as well vision speech happens as so a majority of the developments already happen in the early phases of their life so vision speech emotional development you can you can draw a graph like this if you want because these type of flow charts or graphs are useful to describe the overall trend in development so majority of those skills develop here and which of them and uh, and we can attribute them to the development of the brain because brain provides us this ability either vision speech along with the sensory system okay our eyes our nose our mouth hearing so together with that brain controls all these aspects and majority of the developments take place in the partly in the infancy partly in the early child to the middle child so speech develop what do you notice next so after language skills uh, and speech emotional development children are more and more connected to their parents initially correct so emotionally they are attached to their parents the emotional development already begins that seed for that is already laid out in the early stages of their life because it completely dependent on their mother and father in the family immediate family. so this emotional development attachment to the family happens here and their math skills are counting begins there right how many they got how many chocolates they got 
so they would ask for as many as they can hold two normal right they don't get the idea of keeping all of them they they know how many how many they can carry one two they want to for everything the first word is two not one these i form with my child so he wants two he wants both of his hands is to be filled with chocolate in each so two right so number slowly the concept of counting begins the math and logic begins there also not only emotional development we start seeing the social skills so here social attachment skills social skills develop so meaning starting to interact with the other members members outside the family so this happens slightly later but after about two year period they starting to interact with people around neighbors extended family members they starting to interact they start recognizing the relationships right so some social attachment skills how much to trust how much not to trust whom to trust these skills actually develop at this stage so psychological if you see psychological component sorry okay we already talked about motor development skills which are already visible in the in the mother's womb itself they are able to move various body parts you might have seen in the video as well this continues and this continues till the age of 4 and 1/2 years so motor by the 4 and 1/2 5 years they are able to you know uh, make maximum movements their body with lot of flexibility okay so also this overlaps with the language skills that also developed till about 4 years of age of course more polishing happens to the language but the basic concept of language pronunciation already happens in the early childhood okay and social skills as they go to the school start going to the school or nursery kindergarten at the stage they starting to slowly find out the social skills as well. so they learn how to interact with other children uh, teachers etc happens here right so there are the various developmental aspects that happen so we are trying to attain the maturity along with the growth here as you notice clearly so many examples you can give for both growth and development growth of, of course is more obvious but for development look at the development aspects vision speech emotional social skill development language development all these are examples so attaining that functionality so we we are moving here as you clearly see that from the infancy to the childhood so majority of these things i was telling you here are happening at the in the childhood stage so childhood is basically as i was telling you depends on the source sometimes i think we were talk we stick to this 1 to 3 years is infancy and 4 to 4 and above is childhood about up to 10 years right so 4 to 6 years and 6 to 10 years again they can classify them sub categorize them into early childhood middle childhood etc but so far we already discussed early childhood feature is the eruption of the milk teeth right so in the, in the infancy period that we already talked about it by the time 4 to 6 years they should get the majority of the milk teeth correct so 3 year period and 4 year period that we talked about here approximately up to 36 months so if for our previous classification in the infancy itself milk teeth is obtained most of the milk teeth is there right in the later stages middle and uh, middle childhood is where you notice the loss of milk teeth and gain of permanent teeth so milk teeth is infancy that is how we talked about so don't discuss this under early childhood so as per this sub classification it is as part of the infancy otherwise what do you notice in the childhood period of eruption of permanent milk teeth so main features of childhood is the eruption of permanent uh, teeth and change in the size and the shape so they they tend to become slender they become more active and slender lean in these ages middle childhood 5 to 6 years they tend to be more thinner usually on average and we talked about many other developmental aspects 
steady progress in growth and maturation. Childhood, I was telling you, the growth rate slightly decreases as compared to the infancy where there's a rapid growth in the in these stages. I think we talked about this. Right, rapid growth is seen in the infancy, but in the childhood, growth slightly decreases. Slight decrease in the growth can be noticed here. Steady progress, although growth will happen, but it's slightly lesser rate compared to the infancy. And also rapid progress in neuromuscular and motor development. So you can teach them how to ride bike at this stage. You can teach them how to swim. Nowadays, I think even early, even uh, infants are taken into the water. They are able to make them feel comfortable in the water. But otherwise, the, the skills to swim, skills to ride a bike happens in the middle child. Because they attain the maturity in terms of muscular function. So, neuromuscular and motor development happens here. So, write down the features, few features, stages, few features of each of those stages. If you get a question on describing various stages, you can write this information. So, here we are focusing on the childhood stage. So, eruption of permanent teeth, you know, growth steady progress, but relatively less compared to the infancy, more on maturation side. So, neuromuscular and motor development takes place here and also language skills, verbal growth, quite sophisticated speech. They can say things clearly, right? So, by the time they reach four to five years in the stage, they can actually say things very well. The language skills develop. I was also telling you social skills also beginning to develop here. So, about five, six points. And this is where schooling becomes very important for them. So their majority of the skills, their brain also develops here. But to attain more functionality, exposure is important. Training, so education and exposure is important. Unfortunately, I think the way we teach them, it's like just repeating, repetition of what teachers do. We ask, we force them to just do the way teachers do it, right? I think it's, it must be an exploration phase for them. Initial phases, second class, third class, fourth class, in those stages, it should be the stage where you actually ask them to explore about their abilities. But unfortunately, we already start the race children with the children at that age, right? We want them to get the best rank, best scores possible. But it's the exploratory phase, the phase where they are learning about their own skills. This is where I think that you can see the interest on something. But unfortunately, we force them to do certain things. We want them to do math very well so we can compare with the other children. But it's very important that they're just beginning to understand or realize their abilities. So it's very important that we just guide them in the process rather than force them to do things. So this is where actually proper idea about what needs to be done for future, their interest is starting to appear. Because they're exploring slowly the new things. Right? So then, so with that, I think uh, you, you mostly you talk about the teeth, uh, how teeth are actually erupting and how they are losing teeth in the later stages after middle childhood. So in the adolescence, you start noticing that. And also briefly remember the changes in the growth pattern. So in the childhood, uh, as I was telling you, growth rate slows in early childhood that I already talked to you about. And the girls are only slightly smaller and lighter than the boys during the, these years. So slightly girls actually have slower growth rate in these phases. So heads, head to body ratio is better, but still head size is slightly long, uh, larger compared to the body, but overall in relationship, in proportionality we're talking about here. And slowly what we notice here, so body fat is building up. So when we talk about the middle childhood and later on towards the adolescence, we start noticing that fat is building up. Fat is building up. We talked about the gender differences in fat formation, right? So girls tend to have more fat than the boys, mostly because to satisfy their physiological process. For hormonal development, they require fat. So, girls tend to put on more fat, more weight through the fat. Boys tend to put on more muscles, comparatively. So, you start seeing the 
gender differences here. So gender differences starting to appear. And for this changes and the patterns, our genetics seems to be seems to play an important role. It is determined by our genes. Of course, environment has to play a role. Once we finish the stages, we'll talk about factors. Unless you provide proper nutrition, it won't be possible. But our genetics determine the size of us, length of us. So the patterns are determined mainly by the genes plus food and long. So it briefly connects us to the markers 9.6 where we talked about the differences in body fat, gender differences. So that difference shows up at this stage. Okay, I'll show you a graph on this. Okay. So uh, we notice that the children in the middle child, I think I was already mentioning to you, slower development, slower physical growth. You start noticing the growth spurts when towards the end of the middle child. For about 10 years period, you notice here in the graph. So oh, after 10 years period, you start noticing the growth. And this is called growth spurt, sudden change in the growth. You don't, don't you notice that? And that about 10 to 12 year children, they tend to grow taller very fast especially girls that you notice because the growth spurt happens early in girls compared to boys. They grow faster, they grow taller. If you have, you know, in, in your family, brother and sisters with a two year gap, you can clearly see that girls started growing up quicker or at the same rate as the boy because they have growth spurt happening slightly early than the growth spurt that happens in the boys. So here in the image, you see about 10 years, around the 10 years age where growth spurt what happens in the females, the red, red line is a female version and the blue one here is a male version. So growth spot happens with slight variation, with a bit of overlap. So between 10 to 15 years where you notice the growth spot. That is when they are in the high school, 8 to 10. They suddenly grow. Right? But overall you notice that the growth rate decreases. From the infancy to further on, growth rate is definitely decreasing. It is showing the decreasing trend and sudden blip that you notice here, this is growth spot. And then it decreases towards the adulthood. So such images, so showing differences, even gender differences, but if you want to show, draw a simple graph of this. What are you seeing on the y-axis? Y-axis is growth rate, x-axis is the age. So do you see gender differences, especially with respect to the growth here? Around 10 years of time, growth spot in girls is seen and around 14, 15 years, you see the growth spot in the boys. Like slight variation. And also you notice that seizing of the growth happens early in the girls and later in the boys. They don't grow taller. You notice that in the next stage, after adolescence age, we notice that or within this period, we start noticing that they stop growing up. Whereas males tend to grow for slightly longer duration. So gender differences are noticeable here. Okay, so that is what I was trying to tell you here from the middle childhood, growth spurt, girls become more taller and heavier than boys, boys show growth spurts later. And also you start noticing significant growth in their intellectual component, significant in intellectual growth. Because now they're exposed more and more to the outside world, schools, schooling, and etc. Other exposures uh, increases their intellectual ability. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to the adolescence part. Adolescence is what we're kind of aiming at here because growth spot has happened here towards the end of that, and then it will continue into the adolescence. So, what is adolescence? Usually, about after the child uh, childhood, after ch between childhood and the adulthood. This is where we also see the puberty. Adolescence comes here. And teenagers also we call it teenage. This is also correlates with the teenage ages. 
so this is where enough gender differences like secondary sexual characteristics stand out so primary and secondary sexual characteristics show up so this is a main hallmark of the adolescence beginning happens with puberty and adolescence what we notice is secondary sexual characteristics increasing the gender gap so what changes happen here so reproductive organ development of reproductive organs change in body size and body shape also changes as the secondary sexual characteristics change the way fat deposits take place i think we talked about in body fats male and female versions of the body fat depositions also begin here of course it becomes more clear in adult world but they begin here <laughs> okay hormones so the reproductive uh, organ development and secondary sexual characteristics is a result of hormones i'm going to briefly talk to you in the next next part that the various factors like hormones are the key biological factors that control our growth so hormonal increase happens i'll show you what hormones are important examples i'll give you in the factors for now remember definitely the change in hormones results in these changes sexual maturation and in girls that we see around the age 13 this is the kind of where the menstruation process begins in them we'll talk about that in the next unit unit 11 we'll talk about fertility i'm going to give you uh, i'm going to give you the idea about the pattern of how they vary how age variation happens fertility beginning varies in different populations so some related concepts we're going to talk in the unit 11 so and you also notice that it creates this changes in the body creates lot of uh, uh, it creates lot of psychological stress to the uh, youngsters at this stage right in the adolescent stages you actually notice that they they body image they are more worried about their body image they feel lot of stress but which are natural parts of their their growth right but they notice that emotionally they are attached to that they feel good and bad about these things the body image can put little bit of stress on them okay and also what are the changes happen change in the voice changes at this stage change in the voice happen skin texture changes body hair pattern changes so you see lot of changes here again because of the hormonal difference voice changes skin body hair etc also tends to change in these stages okay some of them part of the secondary sexual characteristics so this is what you normally notice in the adolescence okay i already showed you this image then we move on to the next stage that is adulthood so adulthood again uh, you can divide into sub stages but it's still we're talking about from 18 years onwards to about 55 to 60 years usually we can discuss that as part of the you know uh, phase where we are reproductively active so starting from the about 18 20 years to the 50 55 years sometimes they say some literature in some sources they talk about even up to 65 years this may vary from 
you know, country to country sometimes because the growth rate tends to slightly differ. The activity phase is slightly differ. But in case if you talk about retirement phase, you can think about as the you know phase where they get into the elderly age, where they won't be able to perform things as they used to. They lose that grip. So you can say that until then it is adult. Starting after the adolescence age, which goes up to about 18 years, so between adolescent stages to the retirement age, that's it. Okay, or the phases where reproductive ability actually goes down biologically. So you can divide that into young adulthood, middle adulthood, etc., and later. So young adulthood can be up to 40, middle adulthood 40s and up to 60, and then later adulthood are elderly. You can say elderly. So like that adulthood can be divided into different phases, but mostly it is between the adolescence and the retirement or the age where reproduction, especially in women, it is more distinct because women have starting and ending point. Starting is menstruation, ending is menopause, right? So this is the phase where we, we, we refer it to as adulthood. So what happens? What are the features that you notice here? Do you see much of the growth here in the adulthood? Do they grow much? So do you see much of the concept of growth here? No, we don't. So minimal growth is seen in the adulthood. After adolescence, we tend to seize kind of the growth, but of course, replacement of the damaging skin, damaging tissues may happen, but otherwise no additional growth. You don't grow taller. You are close. You suddenly realize that the clothes you have is good enough, unless you're actually growing, putting, putting on weight. If you're able to manage your weight, you can actually use your clothes for longer duration of time. Not much growth, but maturation do continue. Development, already brain doesn't have much scope to develop any further, but your exposure, your skill set may differ. So some specific things, socially, mentally, psychologically, things change here. Okay, so we don't talk much about the biological components here, but we talk more about the other changes that happen in the body. In adulthood, let's talk about what happens between 20 and 40 years of age. So this is where mostly psychological and social developments take priority. Psychological development, which of course already happened in the since adolescence that we talked about, or even before that, the childhood. So that psychological social developments continue and they take the priority here. Why? Because you might have finished your education. Now you think about career, you think about your own family. So these new dynamics happen in the adulthood. And you feel you're prepared for that physically, mentally, socially, right? So those developments happen. So marital and vocational choices, choices about your career, choices about your marriage happens here. So this defines our personality. Right? So ready to take challenges, you are energetic, you actually have a plan. So you make plans for the rest of the life here in this stage. Make stronger judgments about your life choices. The most important ones is your career and your marriage. Okay, and you're starting to commit to oneself to a specific way through marriage and in raising children. Doc, start taking the responsibility, sharing the responsibilities with them in the family, in growing children. So this is a phase where you feel more responsible. So more psychological and social uh, maturity takes place here. So social structure is also very, very important. How family supports this. You see that uh, variation with respect to the uh, developed countries and developing countries or underdeveloped countries. You have family support. Throughout this process, even young adult would, when you are taking up new responsibilities, when you are actually committing to a relationship, family support is there in countries like India, in developing countries. But if you think about the the developed countries, what happens there? The family support is already lost in the in the adult sense. When you reach the uh, university, bachelor degree, you get kind of cut off from the uh, immediate fear family. So you become your your independent. You make your own choices. Less of interference is more common in the developed countries. In developing countries, we still have the mother and father helping you in making judgments or sometimes even forcing you to make decisions. That who to marry and uh, what type of careers to choose from engineer or doctor. 
so those type of things are still influenced in the developed in the developing country developed countries they don't actually put too much of emphasis they don't actually force they don't even participate too much the trend can be easily seen okay a person has attained adult status with the completion of physical maturity so by then physical maturity is done so he or she has become sufficiently well integrated and emotionally mature to utilize the opportunities so they get exposed enough to the society they they underwent that maturation process physical maturity is attained psychological maturity has probably taken place here and they integrate all that to make judgments either with support or without support depending on what part of the world they are living that is why we actually see less stress in these ages less stress can be felt in the developing countries where there is more family support in them or as i was telling you it depends also on the family whether they are putting more stress or they are relieving stress it depends on so our social structure is very different to satisfy the special specific requirement they have in the early adulthood okay right so these are some specific features we don't talk too much about biological concepts here but mostly the social and psychological concepts can we move on this is something you all can relate right okay then middle childhood what happens afterwards suddenly you start feeling that your energy is going away correct you are not feeling as energetic you used to be in the early adulthood in the middle adulthood so lot of changes happen in our body hair begins to thin and turning gray hair begins to thin and turning gray your skin is losing elasticity and you see more and more wrinkles on your body the ability to hold the skin at elasticity is gone or is slowly disappearing if not completely gone so it disappears so slowly diminishing so lot of biological changes happen hair turning gray and thin the density of the hair decreases here and skin elasticity decreases here and another big biological change is hormonal changes shift in hormones we learn this in menopause for women in 11 11.1 uh, we'll talk about menopause in the next unit so there you will see that how hormones actually change and menopause occurs in late 40s it begins in 40 to 43 years and goes on up to 50 55 years about 7 8 8, 8 period there is a struggle for women so lot of hormonal changes lot of changes mood mood shifts that you normally notice or mood swings that you normally notice to some somewhat to a lower extent you notice this in men testosterone levels decrease okay and sperm production decreases so reproductive life is coming to an end in a way especially towards the end of the middle adulthood or you say towards the elderly if you consider this 60 years i think uh, as we initially discussed so there what happens we start noticing that the decrease in the reproductive ability for women it cessation happens they cannot have the child anymore 52 53 years or 54 years period because menopause finishes there no release of eggs and a gradual change happens in men men as well so this is mostly because of the hormonal changes and hormones in turn control the various aspects of our body like bone density do you feel really strong what happens if you meet with accidents can your bone actually attach very well can they can they uh, you know uh, can they fix can they fix it really well can they recover really well they won't because your bones are weak they tending they are actually becoming weak because of hormonal changes and ability to maintain the tissue structure tissue integrity changes this is where we start noticing the ncd is non communicable disease speaking up so in the middle adulthood is where you start finding the appearance of diseases chronic diseases like diabetes heart problems cancers that we talked about in the epidemiological anthropology they starting to show up in the middle adult
so ages chronic diseases show up in this stage like diabetes heart problems cancers and actually they start feeling that difference as i was telling you energy differences they can feel here they start feeling the drastic changes in their appearance body's appearance and body's energy can be clearly felt so they feel a crisis basically here okay so this is briefly about the middle adult world or basically this is for our initial classification this is about the adult world early and later or middle adulthood so eventually now they go to the elderly stages later adulthood or elderly so further diminution in our ability so some of these don't hold true for our society in india we still have young societies so fastest growing age is more common for majority of the other developed countries europe americas they are experiencing this uh, more uh, older elderly people in their societies But for us this is not true what mostly happens here physical deterioration physical deterioration bones become brittle weak and their vision ability to see things goes down so weak bones poor vision poor hearing so majority of the skills that we develop this is like you know uh, reverse ride compared to our childhood we go backwards our ability to see things hear things smell things goes back and our muscle coordination or or motor skill coordination motor skill ability also decreases poor coordination you won't be able to hold on things very well that is where i think in many developed countries they revisit your driving licenses whether you'll be able to drive well or not so your body is able to cope up or not okay this happens after about 60 years 58 years or 60 years onwards so physiological activities their abilities you know go down so performance wise we won't be able to do very well here some memory issues people start having memory problems forgetfulness okay some people in these ages they must have start experiencing alzheimers like diseases as a neurodegenerative diseases can also be seen here so biologically this is a negative growth in a way that you notice it is a key word you have to remember give examples weak bones poor coordination poorer vision okay and other abilities here memory also and this is where retirement normally happens so what happens here so probably already have a family by then probably have grand grandchildren by then so most of the time they spend by playing with the grandchildren taking care of the fam grandchildren so usually if it is in the uh, extended family they have live in the extended families nuclear families i think now we see the trend of that in india so they are they feel lonely what happens to this if they both both uh, wife and husband if they are together okay if there are less divorce rates because normally we see more divorce rates in uh, developed countries the where they tend to feel lonely they are left out in the elderly care houses or homes right but in in countries like india where of course we are also seeing the change in the trend they get the support of the family right this is a phase where i think they realize that they don't have the same strength and they cannot earn any more so most of them except in the businesses so what happens they they are worried about their health they are worried about their finances and when there is extended family with them 
they get more support otherwise they feel more lonely and given the trend like this in the developed countries they actually have established the old age homes where they are given their own freedom they are given their own time and the care japan usa canada uk in these countries you notice that elderly care has is actually popular where they get the freedom at the same time they get the support physical support that they need for that they probably i would have saved money in government would provide a little bit more money so that is what you notice here this is a stage where they start seeing seeing the deterioration in their physical capabilities and if they are with the family they are able to cope up with this if they are not with the family government support may be taken in the developed countries okay that loneliness is more common and in some majority of the developed countries you notice the depression and suicide rate at the stage because till then they were busy with the job and they were actually having some entertainment outside with the family members etc and friends so at this stage they feel lonely and they feel less energetic so depression is more common in these stages and suicide rate is also high in some developed countries right so that we are coming to the end of the different growth stages we talked about prenatal natal infancy childhood adolescence adulthood we talked about and uh, maturity also part of it so eventually what happens we start seeing deterioration in our body and this eventually leads to what is called senescence i'll discuss senescence separately but uh, in aging and concept of senescence but for now just want to briefly introduce the concept as i've mentioned here so senescence means the ability or the process behind aging in a way senescence is a process behind aging in which cell loses its ability to divide and grow so they lose ability to multiply so we are not adding new tissues new growth or even we are not replacing the dead ones there is a wrinkle starting to happen right so ability of the thinking ability of thinking and other uh, sensory abilities decrease because we are not able to replace the damaged tissues okay this is what means senescence senescence means the process behind cell death okay so a degenerative process that we are talking about in the elderly age this is what happens in in them senescence and finally what happens one or the other parts of the body give up your brain may give up your heart may give up or maybe infections may kill you because your immune system is weak so covid 19 we are seeing people with comorbidities are dying you diabetes you know people with heart problems kidney issues are dying why because their body is not able to cope up so some unexpected thing like covid 19 is killing many many elderly people because their body is not able to tackle especially their immune system so the process behind the loss of this ability is called senescence we'll talk about senescence and aging i'm going to discuss bit on senescence there but for now just remember the idea of senescence is a losing ability to multiply or divide for cells so it's a degenerative process right so with that we finished talking the first part human growth and development next so we'll move on to the factors but for now i think remember the demand of the exam here yeah? so know the various stages and be able to explain one stage in detail i think with enough factual data the prenatal stage is easier to explain if you are able if you are comfortable with the terminology okay otherwise it's your choice you want to explain more about adult world more about childhood is also we have enough scope so you you pick what you want but the higher possibility to score better with the prenatal stages and the postnatal stages like childhood always have the idea if they want if they ask you to briefly explain various stages be aware about these stages and use those graphs stages of growth so show one or two graphs like that growth spurts you know growth stages and if you want development when does that happen the two or three graphs that i was showing you a rough idea about them if you can draw that will be great right this is about the growth stages now let's talk about the growth factors factors affecting growth and development
majority of the things we already might have discussed in other classes related to this some were discussed in the previous unit that is epidemiological anthropology so what i'm going to tell you briefly what to write what aspects to write i'll give you each under each subheading few points for you to write so in the syllabus they have given genetic factors so factors affecting this growth and development concept genetic environmental factors biochemical nutritional cultural socio economic factors six factors they asked about some of them have overlap otherwise genetic and biological factors environment and biochemical which also fits under the biological factors also controlled by genetic factors so nutritional factors you know the importance of nutritional factors in growth we talked about them in epidemiology plant topology briefly cultural factor we'll put a little bit of focus on cultural and socio economic how socio economics and how culture defines the growth rates and development aspects okay what should we discuss as part of this genes let's say so what is the role of genes starting from the initial phases of our life like gender determination what gender is it male or a female defined by whom defined by the genes and chromosomes provided by the parents correct determination of gender begins with the inheritance or genes so gender twins whether it is twins triplets so it may run in families i was watching one video yesterday uh, the triplets are born in a family right some amount of hereditary factor is there but it doesn't guarantee it so twinning may run in families sometimes so it determined by genes again to some extent i don't think there is a clear understanding on this we don't know why and what factors cause twinning and our characteristics our features are determined by our parents skin color for example no shape face shape so mannerisms these are all controlled by our genes okay let me expand a bit on this concept the genetic component here let me talk to you briefly about that few overlapping components we'll talk about here like other biological factors biochemical factors are also included as part of it then i'll move on to the other aspects right so what role does genes play so starting from the gender determination to the our features our ability our disease resistance can be defined by our genes so you can even if you want write down even our uh, disease resistance is also influenced by our genes and what do genes do genes actually set the limitation genes would define our potential genes defines our for potential for growth and development meaning how tall can you grow in a family the upper limit is defined by our genes upper limit is defined by our genes you cannot grow more than what your genes are supporting so in a way our genes set the limit to our potential in growth and development so it is determined by gene but it doesn't happen by itself right i think i was talking to you about this let's say they born into intellectual family the parents are the but you are not sending them to the school you are not exposing to them to any such activities can they grow wise they cannot and let's say that they grow they are actually born in the family where both parents are really tall but you don't feed the baby very well can they attain that height so both genetics although sets the limitation the environmental factors actually influence the outcome the actual outcome so environmental factors influence the growth and development and individual cannot ex exceed their genetic potential so you cannot exceed what is determined by your genes here
so what are the genetic components are important here not only the genes which determine characteristics which give rise to proteins but also elements outside the genes this is called epigenome epigenome elements outside the genetic regions which code for proteins so we also need some other dna elements which define how well the genes are expressed it's how much a given protein is made for muscle built you require enough of the protein made for digestion you require enough of the enzymes being made correct so this expression is defined by few other elements in addition to the genes so not only genes responsible for giving rise to those proteins or coding those proteins also those genes which are part of epigenome which control their expression meaning rate at which they are producing protein so these are regulators we can call them regulators of gene expression So these are elements outside uh, genes. genes. Outside, they are part of the DNA, but they are not part of the gene because genes are the coding, protein coding regions, right? So epigenome is considered to be the other regulated regions in our DNA. So they they cannot be genes, but they are part of DNA. Sir, can you explain again epigenome? Sure. Epigenome is uh, basically the idea where remember this distinction. One in within our DNA we have genes. What do genes do? Genes code for proteins. Like if you want to have protein for hair, keratin, there should be a gene coding for it. You want to have something to control your sugar levels, blood sugar levels. We have insulin. Like the proteins are coded by genes. but how much of insulin is made how much of keratin is made is defined by the regulatory elements where are they they probably are placed somewhere else in our dna we still trying to figure out those okay these are outside the gene but they are part of the dna this is called epigenome so these are the regions which control how genes are expressed and at what rate how much are they expressing the rate at which they are expressing the amount that they are producing defined by epigenome so it's not only the genes part but also the epigenome part is important so it's about genes epigenome plus epigenetics if finish writing about epigenome i'll tell you about epigenetics okay epigenetics remember we talked about epigenetics related to genomic imprinting this is the mechanism behind genomic imprinting we talked about silencing some genes okay prader willi syndrome that we discussed about relationship with this so epigenetics is a changes in the phenotype meaning here it's not your dna that is defining it some changes additional changes on top of dna defining your phenotypes so changes in phenotype that are not related to the changes in underlying dna and how do they happen they may result from the interaction between the genotype and the environment our environment may define may make changes to our dna not the sequence of the dna but the way dna is expressing so instructions are there in the dna but the outcome is defined by one epigenome second epigenetics epigenetics is where environment have influence can have influence methylation some chemical groups are added some genes may not be expressed at later stages of our life because of epigenetic change so instructions are not changing but instructions are maybe masked these are called epigenetic changes so like that it is our genes epigenome epigenetics they play, play an important role in our growth and development so epigenetics is just uh, say uh, only preventing expression uh, not necessarily not necessarily it depends on like for example in the silencing 
genome imprinting we talked about then masking those regions but what if it masks a region which supposed to block it or inhibit it so there you are actually positively influencing it so it can happen at multiple locations in multiple ways thereby uh, defining the actual outcome of the uh, expression so i think various fine now we are realizing more and more about their role previously we thought it's purely our genes that play important role but now we are focusing more on the other aspects of it okay so these are some ideas about the epigenetics part how do you know that genes are playing an important role how do you explain this can be realized with respect to the diseases genetic abnormalities shows us the importance of the diseases importance of the dna elements remember lethal genes we talked about some important essential components essential components of our dna if they undergo mutation what happens we see the loss of that function growth abnormalities we talked about behavioral abnormalities we talked about in chromosomal diseases chromosomal abnormalities down syndrome turner syndrome super female super male what did we learn about some growth delays happen in them some behavioral problems happen in them that they may not attain same intelligence as other people do why because certain aspects of their genetic components are disturbed so they are evident in the chromosomal abnormalities and genetic abnormalities we talked about achondroplasia they don't grow enough what happens small change in the gene they are indicating that the gene is very very important for attaining growth so the importance of genetic elements can be felt through genetic disorders so you can cite these examples of things of chromosomal abnormalities how they lead to growth abnormalities and behavioral abnormalities or intelligence abnormalities or delay in intelligence coefficient so that is indicating that genes play an important role in growth only in absence of them we realize their importance so what else next we are moving from bit genetics to biochemical aspects we also have biochemical factors right we'll talk about biochemical factors so what comes under biochemical factors what type of biochemicals play an important role in our growth and development which i was already pointing out right so biochemicals remember biochemical genetics what is biochemical genetics dna proteins small biochemicals like hormones they all come under biochemical genetics so here biochemical means we should focus more on the hormones hormones are the integral components of our growth they define they specifically define our body's growth so as i was telling you our genes define how much growth do you see so genes coming from our parents which carry instructions define the child child's growth physical size so definitely genes are playing the role so how do genes work some they make proteins and work sometimes the prote some proteins are some of the other molecules because not all hormones are proteins so genes can influence biochemical changes in our body so they are connected as you see the flow here genes are responsible for certain growth aspects in addition to the genes certain biochemicals certain biochemicals which are controlled by the genes so genes influence the growth by controlling the production of hormones and hormones are the examples of biochemicals okay they play very very important role so genes control hormones hormones control growth 
if you want to write like a flow chart. So genes control. Genes also have particular proteins. One arrow mark protein. Another arrow mark you can put hormones. Hormones control. Hormones actually find the timing. They define the timing of our growth. So the coordination is achieved through the release of hormones. So mainly the brain. Brain is our master controller, right? Brain is the master control. So here you write why we are considering hormones as biochemicals. Second, how hormones control various aspects of our growth. So why we are taking hormones as biochemicals. First point, you have to have clarity on this. Second point should be, you know, what aspects of growth and what hormones. Examples of hormones are important here. So for this, first of all, I told you, hormones are biochemicals. They are proteins. Some of them are proteins. Some of them are lipids. Some of them are small molecules. Okay, they, are, they have different uh, chemical nature. But they are biochemicals. They are, in a way, they are chemicals produced by biological systems. So second, our brain is a master controller, master regulator. So brain, especially hypothalamus part of the brain, hypothalamus, in the mid of the brain, if you notice, we have something called hypothalamus. So this is part of the forebrain, they say, but towards the mid part is where we have a region which is responsible for releasing hormones. And this is where we notice pituitary gland, which is known as master gland. So brain is the master regulator of the body. Within the brain, we have master hormonal regulator, which is pituitary gland. So pituitary gland releases a couple of hormones and two hormones that are important here. One is growth hormone. Another one is called thyroid stimulating hormone. Growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. Two very important hormones. Growth hormone more or less coordinates the process of our growth. So brain is a master regulator within the brain, hypothalamus. And attached to the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. This is where majority of the hormones and hormonal control is maintained. So two key hormones with respect to the growth is growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. So let's see what do these two hormones do? How are they playing a role in growth? So first we'll see the human growth hormone. So human growth hormone is secreted by the brain, particular part of the brain, and it can influence almost all tissues in our body. So what do you notice here? If you see the graph here, age and amount of growth hormone, what do you notice? We actually have huge amount of growth hormone starting at our early ages of our life. But as we age, what happens? Growth hormone levels fall. Especially if you draw this line, this is where the highest you see, 20-25 years. So up to the stage, because the majority of the growth is seen before 18-20 years, correct? So during that time, we maintain the growth hormone levels really well. Our growth hormone levels are maintained really well. So during this period, we maintain high amounts of growth hormone. Or from this graph, you can see, this is the period from our birth to about 20 25 years we maintain the growth hormone and then slowly growth hormone levels decrease so this is a key hormone in defining our growth so that is the second point. first point is this is produced by brain this is part of the brain second it is maintained throughout our stages of our life where growth is maximal third you may ask what aspects of growth are they controlling so growth hormone can influence majority of the tissues in our body, like liver, muscle, bones. Okay. So this is released by the pituitary gland and it affects the liver, affects the fat cells, affects the muscle, affects the bone. So this growth, bone growth, muscle growth, amount of fat that you are putting on. So all these are controlled by growth hormone. So it is responsible for bone growth, muscle growth, which is a key component of our growth, right? So it is controlled by growth hormone. How does it do? It allows more protein to be produced, allows more energy to be released by changing our metabolic reactions. Thereby, 
we are able to add more tissues to the body so we grow in size and this is mainly controlled by growth hormone so our genes define this our main master regulator define it but this function is happening in the form of growth hormone so it's a biochemical So the other hormone is the thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone in relationship with growth hormone, if you see, so I I mentioned to you, brain releases TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. That thyroid stimulating hormone influences thyroid gland. Thyroid gland that we have the gland here, right, in the throat. The thyroid gland. This is also a very very important gland for controlling our growth factors. So in the image, you can clearly see the. This is an image that you can use for explaining the importance of biochemical components. So growth hormone is maintained throughout the major stages from birth to the about 18-20 years. Thyroid hormones usually tend to be high in the initial phases of our life, then maintained at certain rate. So thyroxine hormone. T three, T four hormones, or two hormones like that, which which are important for maintaining the various aspects of growth. What aspects do they control? Metabolic rates. They can control the metabolic rate. They can control the metabolic rate. And thyroid hormones are also responsible for brain growth. Growth of brain, various aspects of brain. how do you know that it is evident in what happens people may have more thyroid or less thyroid hormone hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism you notice what happens people are hypothyroidic they put on more weight so weight imbalance happens because of less thyroid hormone people experience memory problems people experience memory problems with thyroid hormones imbalance so we are talking about here metabolic rates so of fat in memory brain functioning third one is fertility so without proper thyroid hormonal balance pregnancy doesn't happen so reproductive health is also defined by thyroid gland which is key part of the adulthood as you notice so thyroid hormones have to be maintained and balanced at certain levels to allow the growth as well as the development the reproductive development it is important reproductive function it is important and also for normal growth in maintaining metabolic activity that is important okay so once these two growth hormone and thyroid hormones are kind of coming to the end of their activity this is when androgens and estrogens reproductive hormones are produced so here in the adolescent stage what we notice secondary sexual characteristics that we talked about are controlled by release of hormones what hormones in females the key hormone is estrogen in males it is testosterone in females it is estrogen and in males it is testosterone so they are responsible for attaining the reproductive maturity either release of eggs release of sperms and also we notice the maintenance of pregnancy so these are controlled by certain hormones so like that hormones are responsible for coordinating and maintaining the requirements of growth starting with growth hormone thyroid hormones and reproductive hormones like androgens and estrogens look at the timing how they are actually produced in our body so as per the need of the body okay
So this is briefly about the hormonal control. I made a brief notes on this that I'm going to share with you. But write down the key points along with the handout that I'm going to share with you. You may be able to read it. I think even in the uh, one uh, document I'm going to share with you. Stain and Rowe Biological Anthropology also, they briefly talked about control of growth and development. There they discussed about the importance of hormones. Endocrine glands produce hormones. Example, growth hormone. Okay, and sex hormones, importance of testosterone and estrogens. They briefly discussed here. So biochemical factors from the point that you have written here, plus this content can help you. Okay, so next we'll talk about Environmental factors, environmental and nutritional factors being most important. We'll talk about nutritional factors. What is the role of nutrition here? I think you know it very well, right? We already discussed about the nutritional factors. So I've made a brief summary on nutritional factors. Majority of the information is already we discussed in epidemiological anthropology part. So what do we discuss here? Is nutrition very important for the growth and development? Absolutely, right? So unless we provide the nutrition, because nutrition provides the raw material for making these cells. So nutrition provides the raw material for making the cells. So we definitely need to provide adequate amounts of the nutrients for providing raw material and also for energy source. So we discussed that already, like macronutrients, so carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. They play an important role. Unless you provide proper amount of nutrition and what plays an important role here, especially in the macronutrients, proteins. They say that proteins play an essential role. Although we need all three, we need carbohydrates, sugars, sorry, carbohydrates, fats and proteins. But protein seems to be the key. So proper diet and balanced diet is important for attaining the or supporting the concept of growth. That is why in India they are focusing on malnourishment problems through portion of here. Okay, here you may talk about essential amino acids that our body cannot make. So some amino acids have to be provided in the form of diet. You might have heard about the concept of essential and non-essential amino acids. Okay, so we have nine different amino acids which are considered to be essential that our body cannot make. You have to provide for sure in the diet. Otherwise, our body cannot grow. So variety of foods are very, very important here to satisfy these requirements. So talk about macronutrients, importance of proteins, if you want importance of amino acids, plus you also talk about the micronutrients. Talk about the vitamins and minerals, importance of vitamins and minerals. I've given few examples here. Like bones cannot grow without calcium, phosphorus and other minerals. So for bone growth, bone is an important aspect of our growth, right? Bones cannot grow without calcium. So unless you provide these inorganic elements, no growth happens. Similarly, iron. Unless you provide iron, no hemoglobin, no blood is formed. So, write down few key aspects of it, which I've already discussed with you. Vitamins, also write down about vitamins. Vitamin A is important for vision. Vitamin C is important for, again, bone growth. Vitamin D important for bone growth. Otherwise, deficiency diseases happen, which we discuss as part of nutritional deficiency diseases. Talk about them. So, definitely proper diet, balanced diet is very, very important. There are few stages of our life which are more and more sensitive to this diet. Starting with the pregnancy, when mother is taking care of you in mother's womb, diet plays an important role. You as a child, unless you receive proper diet, you cannot support the normal growth pattern. So malnutrition is a big problem in India. And if it is properly tackled, the normal health and growth rates can be attained in India. How do they know whether they are actually receiving proper amount of nutrition? We'll talk about it in Unit 12, Applications of Anthropology, where we have nutritional anthropology. There, I'm going to extend more on this concept. How do we know what aspects of anthropometry we need to use there? Okay, but for now, I would like to just stick to the requirements of the body in terms of nutrition and how nutrition plays an important role by providing this raw material and energy sources for attaining the normal growth. So next, environmental factors. What can you write under environmental factors? So this is something that I, do, I don't need too much of explanation. Right? What type of environmental factors play an important role here? 
variety of the things so environment means elements around us elements around us so they can either positively or influentially affect our growth example nutrition may be taken as part of environment so people who are on poor nutrition can they attain normal growth they may not so because of poor nutrition what happens if mother is poorly fed the children tend to be born with lower weight low birth weight is common in children low birth weight so poor nutrition low birth weight so poor nutrition low birth weight and many other habits like alcohol abuse smoking so habits they can affect the growth very much parents habits on children and because they define the environment let's say parents are actually smokers parents are into alcohol the damage that it can cause on children directly and indirectly is very important so environment is defined by these things poor nutrition low birth weight alcohol and smoking and drug abuse pollution so whether we live in the polluted areas i have made a summary on this so briefly listen to me listen to this points i have made a summary on this so know what points to write here alcohol drug smoking and chemical exposure pollution so these play an important role so i briefly discuss this pollution how does what type of role does it play so children developing children they are very sensitive even in the mother's womb the fetus and also developing stages proper environment is important so if you have air pollution high air pollution what happens respiratory organs it, it will take toll on respiratory organs so poor growth can be seen can be witnessed because of pollution so here both indoor and outdoor pollutions play important role especially in these early stages indoor pollution plays an essential role so it can negatively influence the growth and growth retardation takes place they may not have normal growth in presence of various pollutants air pollution even sound pollution can affect the growth air sound water pollution what happens water pollution results in various diseases diarrhea diarrhea is a common problem in india what happens it takes the energy that is required for supporting growth so your body is struggling to maintain disease free condition if you have diarrhea the essential nutrients are gone you you lose weight so negative impact can be seen because of water pollution so air water sound pollution can have negative impact on our growth like that i have given few examples lead exposure in the paints household paints lead is present and the lead lead can be harmful to us okay so lead can affect the body's growth normal body's growth and it can affect the growth of the brain and other organs so like these type of chemical pollutants can cause effect right so chemical pollution water air sound pollution can negatively influence the growth especially various aspects of the body hormonal imbalances can happen pesticides can reduce hormones can lead to fertility issues you can also give that examples pesticides are known to cause infertility certain pesticides are known to cause infertility so reproductive uh, damage so growth aspects related to the reproduction can be affected similarly alcohol how does alcohol can affect you know it very well right either parents parents who consume alcohol mother especially who when consumes alcohol it can influence the brain development of the child so presence of alcohol in mother's body can influence the can delay the child growth not only mother the studies are showing that even fathers alcoholic habits can influence child growth so some neuroscience departments they are performing research on this and see how behavioral problems can be seen in the child when father is alcoholic now even before birth okay so alcohol can impact what you know you know normally right when we are under alcoholic influence how well our brain works how well our coordination aspects work so temporary effects are seen and if in the early stages of our life when brain is developing spinal cord is developing alcohol can actually can impact their their development 
they can indeed damage the brain and spinal cord developments if alcohol is consumed by the mother okay so development problems physical development and as well as the learning and behavioral problems can be seen in the children whose parents are alcohol okay similarly cigarette smoke i mentioned here smoking also provides i think negative impact on or causes negative impact on the growth it is considered to be the greatest threat so pregnant women who are either pass passively or actively smoking so someone in the family is smoking they tend to have children with low birth weight so low birth weight is connected to many problems premature labor can happen because of smoke premature and stunting can be seen and children who are born with low birth weight are prone to more more and more diseases their immune system is compromised they say so low birth weight makes them prone to more infections so low birth weight is the cause or one of the causes smoking okay and also smoking can trigger premature labor and stunting in the children and smokers tend to actually have particular chemicals called myostatin in their body which inhibits muscle growth so smokers tend to be lean why because they produce more and more chemicals called myostatin which inhibits the muscle growth so that is why smoking can passive smoking is more common problem than active smoking so children who who live in the uh, family environment where smokers are there they may tend to have lesser mass muscle mass because of sudden biochemical changes in the body okay also smoking long term exposure to smoke can result in bone density loss of bone density so osteoporosis weak bones are common in smokers so our body maintenance and growth can be affected by this in this man okay but right. i'm going to stop the class here so we here with about the today we finished talking about various stages of human growth we discuss the genetic changes and biochemical changes nutritional changes or nutritional factors sorry genetic factors biochemical factors nutritional factors and i briefly talk to you about the environmental factors so tomorrow i'm going to focus on cultural factors cultural as well as the socio economic factors with that we'll finish factors and we'll start with the growth studies and aging theories and senescence concept in tomorrow's course okay right any questions guys on what we discuss is not too complex we need to know the concepts clearly here and examples what to write okay so i'm providing you this factors brief material on factors this one as well as allen and stanford material where we can connect to the nutritional deficiency diseases and to the importance of nutrition for our normal growth so it covers both overlaps between them okay also they briefly talked about uh, a few aspects to focus on the next unit unit level okay so you read that we're going to discuss few aspects of this in tomorrow's class as well right so okay. any questions that you have feel good okay thank right you, sir. thank you have a good night thank you sir